All right, so for this talk, we're going to um, look at gender. And the first aspect of gender I want to make clear is we need to distinguish between sex, which is biological, and gender, which is cultural. Okay, let me say that again. Sex is biological. It has to do with genes and chromosomes. And gender has to do with masculinity and femininity. It is what your culture teaches you how the different sexes are supposed to behave. All right, so there's a lot of confusion when we get into this topic about sex and gender. And I should have prepped this ahead of time, but I'm gonna pull up a chart I use in some of my other classes. We just covered this in ethics yesterday. And I like this chart called the gender bred person. Okay, and let me pull up one. Oh, I got to share my screen, don't I? Sorry. Still navigating this technology. Here we go. So I don't know if any of you have seen this chart before. And whether you agree with this chart or not, I think it is important that you're aware of the terms because in our culture, these are the way the terms that our society is using to describe these differences. So as you can see in this little gender-bred person, um, let's start with sex. That's the biological piece. And you see the symbols there, the arrow for male, the cross for female, and where you have the arrow and cross together, that would refer to transgender or intersex people, people that have both ma male and female um, chromosomes. All right. So sex is the biology of a person. It's determining whether you're male, female, or intersex. Attraction, that is who you are sexually attracted to. Um, if you are a biological male attracted to another biological male, that is what we would call homosexual attraction, same sex attraction. The same would apply if you're a biological female and you were attracted sexually to other biological females, we would call that homosexual attraction. Hetero means other. So if you're a biological male attracted to a female, that would be a heterosexual attraction. And so your sex or biology does not necessarily determine your heart or your passion who you're attracted to. The next piece, and this is where we have a lot of confusion and debate in our society at large, let alone in Christian circles, is this identity piece. And this is how you think of yourself or identify yourself. So you, if you are a biological male with XY chromosomes, but you identify or think of yourself as female, that is what we were talking about. And um, this is what psychologically is called gender dysphoria, where your identity does not match your biology. Are there any questions on this so far? So sex is biology, identity, that is the gender piece. How do you see yourself as male or female, masculine or feminine? And then the last piece is expression. That's how you present yourself. If you're a biological male who presents yourself in a masculine um, manner and thinks of yourself as a male, this is what we would call a cisgender male. But if you are a biological male who identifies yourself as a female, I mean, you might present yourself as male or female, but on the inside in your mind, you're thinking of yourself in the feminine as a female, even though you may have the biology of a male. This is what we would call transgender, All right? I, I do wanna make a distinction between transsexuals and transvestites. Um, transsexuals are people 
that actually are identifying with a sex other than their biological sex. And some of them will actually go to the extreme of hormone therapy or even surgery to physiologically change their body, at least in some ways. Um, what I want you to understand though, is that the XY chromosomes are at the cellular level. So you would literally have to change that chromosome in every cell to truly change someone from one sex to the other but they can do genital reassignment surgeries. They can give you either testosterone or estrogen, which would help develop those secondary a male or female characteristics, like a hairy body for testosterone or enlarged breast um, with estrogen. And then the expression piece, there are some people that are biological males or females, but they dress or present themselves in a manner of the opposite um, sex and gender. Um, this is what we would call a transvestite. And the way I remember the difference personally between transvestite and transsexual is vestment. Think of vestments like putting on of clothes. And so you could have a biological male that presented himself as a very feminine female, um, but this could still be a heterosexual cisgender person who thinks of themselves as male, who is attracted to females, but they like to present themselves as a female. I like the little sliding scales on this too, where you can calculate, like they don't see it as either or, they see it more as like a continuum on the spectrum. And with Carl Jung and other psychologists and anthropologists, they talked about this idea of how we all have this anima and this animas, this male and female characteristics within each and every one of us. And remember, when, when we're in utero, as we're developing, male and female children are developing the same until like for um, males in the embryonic stage, there comes a period where there is like this testosterone wash that goes through their bodies, and it even separates the hemispheres of the brain. There are physiological differences between male and female brains, and part of that is caused by testosterone. And so th that's quite fascinating to think about. All right, I'm going to stop this screen share. Anyone have any questions or comments? I, I, I just think this is so completely fascinating. When I was growing up, you got the choice of two genders. You could be male or female. And the last application I filled out, I was given nine choices. And I was actually even a little offended by it. Maybe it's because I'm coming from California. It was for the National Academy of Religion and they gave me nine different gender choices to choose from, but there wasn't an other box. And I was really kind of put out and offended that they didn't allow me other choices besides the nine they had given me. If you've ever had this conversation with any of the professors at this school, especially the Bible department, um, it can be quite frustrating. Uh, my good buddy, Steve Witten and I, when I can't even have this talk with him because every time I try, he just quotes Genesis at me, male and female created he them in the image of God. I'm just like, yeah, Steve, that was in Eden, in perfection. We're a long ways gone from Eden. And the curse has not only affected the ground, but even our genetic code. And there are breakdowns and flaws and mutations that some people are not born male or female. They are born male and female. And are you just going to deny that those people exist? I mean, what nonsense. In the past, these people were called hermaphrodites. And depending on the culture, sometimes they were killed, infanticide at birth. Other times they were revered as being the special ones sent from the gods with special powers and often worked as oracles or healers or because they had both masculine and feminine concepts. Um, there's very true few hermaphrodites, those that have um, both fully functioning male and female genitalia 
or testes and ovaries, um, very rare. Most people are like a split, like 90, 10, 80, 20, et cetera. And at birth, it's often the parents and doctors will decide which sex they want that child to be identified as and to be raised. And my problem with this is what if what's going on in that identity piece of that young intersex hermaphrodite person as they come into puberty and adolescence, what if you choose chose wrong? Um, there was a, a story years ago about this young man who the doctor had made an accident during his circumcision and had accidentally removed his penis. And instead of just dealing with it and then maybe um, creating a prosthetic for the young man when he got older, th they surgically reassigned him as a female and removed his testes and penis entirely. And when this young person came to adolescence, they were really confused because they had this really strong attraction to women. But as far as they knew, they were a biological female. They had been raised a female their whole life, but their identity kept telling them they were a male. And finally, his mother in exasperation and fear for his life told him what happened when he was an infant. And on one hand, the, the young man was relieved, but on the other, you can imagine quite angry with what had been done to him. But he went on to live the rest of his life as a male. And I think, that, I mean, he wasn't able to have children or anything, but they were able to do some prosthetic reassignments so he could at least live and function as a, a biological male. Super interesting. Okay. Any any questions on biology or gender? I mean, this is such a hot topic in our culture right now. Does anyone have any questions? Clarity? Part of what adds to the confusion, I believe about five years ago, the state of California passed legislation saying that gender as well as sex is biological. Now, I think the intention behind it was noble. I think they were trying to protect the rights of transgender people. And if you could say that this is just something that happened to you at birth, um, it was part of your genetic makeup, then we should afford the same rights to transgender people that we would to African Americans or women or Southeast Asians or, or whatever biological group you want to talk about. Um, the problem is I think it, it creates more confusion and removes the power that culture has on determining what is masculine and feminine behavior of the people that live in that society. All right. I wanna start with an example from the book. And it, it this is gonna sound like a Dr. Seuss book and maybe it should be. It's, this would make a good children's book maybe if any of you are creatives. And I believe this is somewhere in an island in the South Pacific and the people are called the who, H-U-A, the people of who believed in the principle of new, in you. And the principle of new was life giving substance. And in this culture, men were perceived as being dry and women were perceived as being damp or wet. Obviously, dry is more attractive and women gain strength through sex because they are dried out by the male and women are weak and men are weakened by sexual congress because they are dampened by the female. Fascinating. So here's a culture where you have women craving sex or desiring sex in order to dry out their souls or this principle. And you have men trying to avoid any contact with women because they don't want to be dampened or feminized. Um, the young men in this tribe would all live in a big long house because they didn't want to be associated with women. They would eat foods associated with dryness like dried fish jerky, nuts, seeds, salty, dried out things, liver. <laughs> okay. And the women, of course, um, 
things like fruits and vegetables and sauces and that is going to add to the dampness in your life so you want to invo- avoid the damp things that will dampen you like i suppose sex drugs and rock and roll and rich um foods and you want to appeal to those things that dry you out and at least philosophically speaking i suppose that would be things like theology mathematics philosophy would dry out your soul as opposed to other disciplines which might dampen you the only women allowed in the longhouse were those who were past um, their monthly cycle um, because as women get older they get drier and so post childbearing women could hang out with the young men, but young um, childbearing age women could not. Now, if a man did take a wife and lived with her, what would happen is um, the dampness of the woman and the dryness of the man would kind of move to the center. So the woman would become drier and the man would become moister. I mean, look at me for heaven's sakes. When I was your age, I looked like a jackrabbit. I was skinny, I had leathery skin. Now I've been so dampened, I just feel so feminized in my culture. And maybe it's because I've been enjoying those things that tend towards dampness as opposed to dryness in life. Um, Any other comments or questions about, this would be a great ethic to write out the ethic of dryness. It would also make a good antiperspirant or deodorant commercial, I think. The the people of who and the principle of new. Just be dry, baby. <laughs> it's the goal of the culture. Um, I want some participation from you guys. In this is one of those cultural universals we have is that every society um, in the history of mankind has had gender distinctions. Even though we have had attempts at egalitarian societies, there still are gender roles. And what I'd like to do is a little exercise, and I'd like you to list some of the male or female gender roles in our society. So are you talking about like, women are to be like homemakers, do the cooking and the cleaning, exactly. taking care of the children. Those are Where American. Where supposed to like bring home the bacon. Exactly. Those are American gender cultural stereotypes. Okay. And I don't, I'm curious because you guys are considerably younger than me. I, I was brought up in incredibly strict gender role stereotypes from um everything from what i ate to how i dress to how long my hair could be um even to my internal emotive state i was brought up not being allowed to cry because boys don't cry and there's no crying in baseball right that whole masculine um stoic attitude that we're supposed to men are supposed to stuff their emotions they're supposed to be strong independent leaders, self-sufficient, self-reliant, where females are taught to be demure, to be meek, to be gentle, to be kind, to be passive. Um, Fascinating, right? Because those are external expectations put upon us. And in ethics, I talked about the difference between sex and gender, but I also talked about temperament and how in our society, if you're familiar with Hippocrates's four temperaments, he had choleric, phlegmatic, sanguine, and melancholy. Now the choleric and sanguine temperaments are extrovert temperaments. Those people are energized by being with other people and phlegmatic and melancholy are introvert temperaments. And these people are energized or most at peace when they're alone. I do not personally believe um, Well, I believe temperament is inherited. Some people believe it's taught, but you can see temperament running through family lines, but you could say, well, they're learning it from their parents or their grandparents. So whether it's taught or learned, um, they're cross gender. You could have a female or a male that are both choleric, but see in our culture, 
a choleric female is seen as being masculine because clerics are type A personalities, they're natural born leaders, they're people of action, and they get the job done. But often in getting the job done, they run over other people doing it. Now, if a male in our culture behaves that way, it's seen as totally appropriate and masculine. But if a female behaves that way, she might be called bossy or domineering and not fulfilling her role in society. I mean, people might go so far to think she was a bull dyke or, or a lesbian because she's not taking on those stereotypical roles in American society. The same thing for a phlegmat, phlegmatic. If you're an American male who's phlegmatic, and that's like the easygoing, you never get rattled, everything's chill, everything as it should be, that's perfectly fine if you're an American male. You can be strong and domineering, or you can be chillaxed and chill. Those are both acceptable ways of being a man. But if a woman doesn't show any emotion, if she never cries, if she never gets exasperated, people might assume she's frigid or, or an ice maiden and has no feelings or emotion. Now, when we go to the next two temperaments, sanguines, that's that gregarious, loves to be around people, wear their emotions on their sleeves. They could be laughing one minute, crying the next, laughing five minutes later. In our society, it's perfectly acceptable for women to behave that way. But if you're a man that's super emotional or relational and needy to be around others, that is seen as being feminine. And melancholy, the last temperament, this is like the deep, brooding, moody, artistic, perfectionistic temperament. Once again, if you're a brooding, moody male, people might think you're um, gay or effeminate. But if you're a brooding, moody female, it's just written off, of, that's just how women are wired or that's how they behave. So I just think that's an interesting parallel how different cultures have different temperamental expectations upon the members of that culture. And I have some great videos I'm gonna show you at the end of this talk on the wild diversity in the world of gender roles and what we think of norm in our society is very different in others or other cultures take our norms to a whole other extreme that's hard for us to imagine. Any other questions or comments? I really enjoyed the, sorry, the four temperaments. Um, I feel like they make a lot of sense um, and are a lot simpler, um, you know, making little combinations between those four rather than having nine or 16 or, you know, unlimited numbers of personality type. I like the other ones too, but that one makes the most sense. Um, yeah. I'm just old school and that was the first one. And as a philosopher, the first one I was aware of, I mean, I think Myers-Briggs can be very helpful and the um, Enneagram, is that how you pronounce it? Uh, but oh my goodness, the Enneagram is fantastic because not only do you have nine divisions instead of four, but then each of those nine have wings that come off of them um, that relate to you. And so it's, I think it's maybe more precise in a lot of ways, but that's a lot of information to be holding in your head if you're trying to do a, a self-evaluation or understand the other people you're relating to. Maybe I just need to study it more, but um, I feel much more adept with Hippocrates. All right. Sexual division of labor. Um, even though America is becoming more and more egalitarian, in fact, there's very few jobs now that women are excluded from. When I was a young man, there were a lot of jobs women could not do. In fact, even in our language and our job descriptions, it showed the gender role distinctions. Policemen, firemen, milkmen, right? All of these were jobs that men were doing. But now we talk about law enforcement officers right and it's even in the military we have allowed women and didn't a female just complete the ranger training or something 
I mean, I think she was one of the few who've ever been able to complete it. But even in something that taxing and demanding in the military is now open to women. Can anyone think of any jobs women are excluded from in America besides being president? That was a joke. I would honestly say there's a lot of, uh, there's a few things in the military that the women are not doing. Oh, please en enlighten and me, David. It, when it comes to, uh, I may be a little biased or sexist, but this is like, when it comes to the Ranger School and the MARSOC and all these different, uh, you know, high speed things in the military, sure, women can do it but majority of them cannot. And the ones that do make it, uh, the first ones, I have a belief that they were helped along the way. Okay. That's just my, my personal opinion. No, thank you. I appreciate it. And that, that may be true. I do not know. And that, that would be problematic, of course, if you were depending on a certain level of achievement and if that was compromised to get a particular group or gender in, um, that could be a liability to the rest of the group. Right. right, right, it definitely is a liability. And it's not, It's I don't think it's me being sexist but for saying this because men are built differently than women. Um, I mean, there's all, I mean, obviously there's some women that are way stronger than some men, uh, which those men most likely are most likely, you know, boys, but uh, for the most part, the, the men can uh, withstand a lot more stress to their bodies than women. All right. Thanks, David. Now, obviously there, I mean, when it comes to the uh, females, I mean, they, they do, uh, handle a lot of pain with you know every month and, and having a kid that the men can't handle. So I mean there's there's some things that the men can handle more so than women and, and then the women can handle more so than the men. So all right. Thank you. Yeah I don't know if any of you have seen it those YouTube videos where they have men hooked up to like elect electronic devices to simulate the pain of the contractions of childbirth. And they're quite entertaining to, to watch how these big burly men just become whimpering little balls of mush when they're they're trying to um, simulate what their their wives or women go through through the the birthing process. So, if you need to be entertained this afternoon, you might want to Google one of those. They're they're quite I find them quite entertaining, and so do the women who are part of the conversation, and. Okay, moving onwards. Um, so America is becoming more and more egalitarian. I just find it so hard to imagine. They, I saw an interview of a woman who was alive during Franklin Delano Roosevelt's presidency. In fact, he was the first president she voted for. And that woman, she, I think she's like 104 years old. And she was, they had her because she was mailing in her ballot. She lived through that um, 1919, was it 1918, 1919 pandemic, if you can imagine. And so now she's living through another one towards the end of her life. But in her lifetime, women did not have the right to vote when she was a little girl. That is how much incredible change has taken place just in one person, one woman's lifetime in our country. And I just find that so remarkable. All right. In Native American cultures, and remember when I'm speaking super broadly, because we're talking in North America alone, there's over 500 different nations or tribes, um, distinct groups. But in those groups, there was generally a strict division of labor. Now, normally in hunter-gatherer societies, I think I mentioned earlier, women are usually more into the gathering end of the spectrum and men are more on the hunting end of the spectrum. But the Native Americans did have exceptions. And they also did not believe there were only 
two genders, male and female. They also believe some people were born with what they called two spirits. And the Ho native Hawaiians also have this belief in two spirit people, which means some people are born with both a male and a female spirit, where most of us are born with either a male or a female spirit. In the Plains tribes, and if you saw the movie with Dustin Hoffman called Little Big Man, there's a character in there who is a Burdachi. And a Burdachi is someone who has taken on the gender of the opposite sex. And this character in Little Big Man's name was called Little Horse. And he was a Burdachi. Even though he was a biological male, he dressed as an Indian woman and he loved the things Indian women did. He loved staying in camp. He loved weaving baskets. He loved doing the bead work in his in the buckskin clothes. He loved cooking and taking care of the children. And it, he was like a very feminized male in that culture. But the culture respected that. They thought he had different insights or abilities. Often they were involved as midwives or healers that they had religious roles and offices, but they were not looked down upon or shunned per se by society, but society had made a place for them. And in some cases, Burdachis actually took um, mates um, from the opposite, I mean, from the same gender. So you might have a Burdachi being the wife of an Indian brave. In Hawaiian culture, we have Mahus and Mahus are part of this two spirit where they believe they have both a male and female spirit. And so they may exhibit both masculine and feminine qualities. And they may present themselves um, simultaneously as male and female, or maybe female in certain occasions and male in other occasions. In the West, we have, um, like Kaylee already pointed out, man as breadwinner and woman as homemaker. And there are three theories in our book of why there is a sexual division of labor. And I think these are interesting. Um, and these, actually, these are hypotheses. They're not theories. So the first is called the strength hypothesis. And this says, kind of like what David was pointing out, because biological males and biological females are physiologically different, some tasks and jobs are more appropriate for men than they are to women. The second is called the fertility maintenance hypothesis. And I don't know if any of you women have experienced this, but females, if they're under excessive duress or stress, and maybe some of our female athletes or others have experienced this, if your body is under an incredible amount of stress or strain, it can actually affect your fertility and even your menstrual cycles. And so part of the idea, the hypothesis is women are given less physically intensive jobs so as not to affect their level of fertility in a culture. And then the third is called the child care compatibility hypothesis. The child care compatibility hypothesis. And what this is basically is saying is that men have do not have the capacity to raise young children like women do. And that's part of why we have women in child care and child rearing is because if it was left to men, maybe a lot of children wouldn't make it to adolescence. <laughs> I don't know, I kind of think this one's sort of true. And maybe it's not across the board to biological male and females, but I know this biological male, I love little kids and babies but good night, they are exhausting and overwhelming. I just, I can only do it for small periods of time. Um, and also I think it has to do with how we're wired. Um, men are generally pretty single-minded, uh, one track mind sort of idea where women seem to have an ability. Um, I hear multitasking is a myth and I think that's true. We can only do one thing at a time. But I think women have the ability to switch from what they're doing much more rapidly than men do. 
and at least the women I know in my life, I, I know when I get locked onto something, it's really hard for me to focus on anything else. And if I'm locked into childcare, I'm not going to be writing philosophy books. I'm not going to be out working in the yard. I'm not going to be cooking dinner because I'm all focused totally on that baby. Yeah, I agree with you on that one too. <laughs> now, I'm not saying men can't be nurturing and caregivers and all of that. But as a general rule, just like the strength thing, there are some women that are incredibly physically fit and powerful and could pound me into the ground. I have no delusions about that. But generally, overarchingly speaking, most biological males are physically stronger than most biological females. Um, so childcare compatibility, I love it. Or I read an article years ago in Reader's Digest that really resonated with me on this topic. And it said, women teach children how to be good winners. Men teach children how to be good losers. And I really like that because that's an important thing to know, how to be a gracious winner and how to be a gracious loser. And I love the empathy piece of women teaching children how not to boast or brag you want to be proud of your accomplishments, but you don't want to make other people feel bad about it. Where men are good, because all of us as men have probably lost many times, to how do you carry yourself with honor and dignity, even in defeat, and not to let it emotionally or socially crush or destroy you. And I think that's really true. And even when I think about to my own childhood, when we would have family board game nights, and we would play Monopoly together. And the gender distinctions were so pronounced, it, it was phenomenal. My mom was great because if you landed on one of her properties, she would just say, oh, honey, don't, don't worry about the rent. It's, let's just call it a visit. You're just visiting me. But my dad insisted on being the banker. He insisted on having the rule book. He insisted on us playing by the rules. And so I, I liked how my father's emphasis was on integrity, playing by the rules, everything applied equally to everyone. There were no favors or give me's, but how my mother, she didn't care about winning or losing. She was there to be with the family, to be with her children. For her, it was about building relationship and community and family. And so I love those different gender role models that are coming from the masculine and the feminine and how they're both necessary. Wow, is that it? Okay, that's it. So once again, even though our textbook is coming from a cultural relativism perspective, which means they're not saying which way is right or wrong, they're simply giving examples in the chapter about how different cultures and different times have different gender roles. They're just describing it. But what I want you to think about, and we'll talk about this after I show you a couple videos, is are there biblical gender roles for men and women or are we equal in christ and there shouldn't be distinctions between masculine and feminine actually so i don't have to edit it back in let's have that conversation right now and then we'll end with a couple of videos so are there biblical guidelines for gender roles that, that should transcend culture? And should we bring our culture into compatibility with the biblical teachings? Now, the Bible's interesting in that it too is descriptive, right? And you have to determine what is descriptive in the Bible, where the Bible's simply recording how things were or are from how God is telling us how we ought to be. And so in the Old Testament, we have very clear gender roles, right, between men and women in the Old Testament. Um, it's kind of like that hunter-gatherer model. The women were the traditional housekeepers, um, child rearers. They take care of the home where men were out either hunting, taking care of the flocks, doing business, sitting in the gates of the city. But the women were at home. That was her domain. That's where she was taking care of. But when we get to the New Testament, 
there seems to be some mixed messages. On the one hand, there do seem to be roles for men and women in the church, but in other passages by the same author, Paul, we have this profound egalitarianism. And I'm thinking of the verse that talks about how in Christ, there is neither Jew or Greek, bond or free, male or female, but we are all one in Christ. And so how do you reconcile that with passages like Ephesians, where women are told to be silent in the church. Talk to me. I think this. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. There's two of us here, or a couple of us here. Um, I think there's different parts in the Bible where it kind of describes what a man and a woman's space should be in a marriage, but not specifically inside of marriage i think there's a lot of um you know stories of women you know there's there were women judges there were women warriors that you know led armies there was esther who saved the whole nation um i think there's plenty of varied women leaders in the bible that did incredible things um yeah so yeah even in the old time there's a whole lot of prescriptive gender roles more descriptive and then just try to help people have loving relationships and, and marriages that work well. Okay, well, let's get more specific then. Um, how about gender roles in the church? Should they exist or is that part of our fallen carnal cultural nature where we're still um, putting women down, keeping them in their place, and not letting them to fully actualize what God wants them to be. In, in other words, let me get more specific. Should we allow women to be pastors? Should we allow them to be elders? Should they be allowed to be deacons? Should they be allowed to be evangelists or missionaries? Or does that all need to be in the context of they are a helpmate, and they can be a pastor's wife or a missionary's wife, or an evangelist's wife, but they are not to take on that mantle of headship or authority for themselves. And see, what's part of so difficult about this is how are you supposed to interpret the Bible outside of your own culture? For one, we are reading it in English. I mean, I don't know enough Greek or Hebrew to read it in the originals, which means someone has already interpreted it who took it from the original languages and put it into English because with each Greek or Hebrew word, there could be a range of English equivalencies. And depending on what equivalency they pick, it could change the trajectory of what the passage is trying to say. So I'm already dealing with one person's interpretation. And now I have to deal with me coming to it and looking at who wrote it, to whom, what is the context? How is this in light of the rest of scripture? How were they affected by their culture? How am I affected by my culture? And it's, be, it's very difficult, especially with issues like women in ministry, to how do we find out what the will of God is, especially from scripture, while at the same time being aware of our cultural presuppositions and biases. Uh, Fred, what are your like personal conclusions on that? Uh, sorry, I asked first. <laughs> After you guys tell me, I'm happy to share mine, but I don't want to um, poison the well. Well, like for me, it doesn't make sense, like just out of my own human reasoning, why like God would give you a potential incapacity for like very specific tasks and then say, oh, sorry, you can only go this far. Like you can't fulfill this fully. So you're saying if if you are given um, the gift of the spirit of pastor or teacher, that God forbid that man should um, prohibit you from using those spiritual gifts? Yeah. And that's... to be clear, this is my opinion, Autumn. I don't think the Bible has spiritual gifts being gender specific. I think a woman could have the gift of pastor or teacher. Uh-oh. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, because I feel a very specific calling on my life, like to speak and to share. And then that's something that I struggled with is like thinking, oh, I can't fill my full potential just because of like ideals, ideas in our society or in our religion. Anyone else? Thanks, Autumn. I think Steve Witten makes a really great distinction here. And I want to give him credit for this because this was a new concept to me. He says, part of the problem is in American culture, we have taken the spiritual gift of pastor or teacher, and we have turned it into a role or a position in the church. So instead of the pastor being like a shepherd, someone who looks over the flock, we've turned it into this leadership or headship role where we talk about senior pastors or associate pastors or youth pastors. And I think that's super helpful. And I think how Autumn, how um, Witten would address it, he would say, if God has given you the gift of pastor teacher, by all means, you should use it. Where Steve might have a boundary though is, he might say, you should pastor and teach women. He's not denying your spiritual gift of pastor or teacher, but I think he would probably be uncomfortable you using that gift in, in the realm of men and women, or if it was as a role of authority, as opposed to simply a gift for the body of Christ. What do you think about that, Autumn? That's, that's Witten's opinion, by the way, not mine. Well, I think a lot of times our own uh, like mental constructs are restrictive. Like we, we pick things to be one specific thing and we just kind of block out everything that doesn't fit our own definition. Um, over, was it December? I got to go um, to Denver and I met a scholar theologian and he knew Greek. And for his doctoral thesis, he was exegeting the passage in Ephesians, talking about women are to remain silent in the church, etc. And he was doing research on this ancient Greek text called Xenophon, which I think was found in the 1800s. But recent scholarship has placed it as a, at a much earlier date than people had previously thought. People thought it was from maybe the 5th century but apparently it was written in first century Ephesus. And that's the same time when Ephesians would have been written. And so it gives you a lot of cultural insight of what's going on in that city, which may help us understand why Paul was saying the things he did. And if you're familiar with the temple or city cult worship of Diana or Artemis, this fertility deity goddess of the Ephesians, that the devotees of this goddess would learn chants and incantations that they would speak publicly when they would come into a group. And, and what this person I talked to believes is that you had people who had converted or were from paganism into Christianity, but they were bringing those practices into the church and they were doing these oratory chants, and I don't know if they were towards God or Jesus or Diana, but he believes that's what Paul was speaking against. Not women speaking or preaching or praying or prophesying, but bringing in these pagan chants and incantations into the assembly of Christ. Now, Witten, I'm sure, and this would be a fun public discussion <laughs> to have with them, would be locked and loaded and say, yeah, but if you look in the passage, Paul refers back to the order of creation and the fall to show why there's a hierarchy. But once again, if you understand Diana worship and the mother, 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 mother goddess cults, you had a matriarchy. And in Diana worship, their creation account had woman first and man was created from woman. And so they had a completely different role and hierarchy. And so he simply could have been addressing that, turning the whole. But that's one of those issues where it's so hard because of our culture, because of our push of egalitarian thinking, 
how can we be faithful with what the scripture is trying to say while filtering out these cultural biases or in ways we've been enculturated to thinking about things like who's in leadership in the church? What is the role of women in society, in the home, in worship and ministry? And I am certainly not going to pretend to tell you what God's will is for, for your lives, especially if you're a woman. And I personally think I would have a really hard time, especially with evangelical or more conservative fundamentalist type Christianity and the role women have been given in those groups. Um, if I was a woman, it would be hard not to feel second rate or bitter or resentful that why can't I teach? I'm intelligent. I have the Holy Spirit in me. I'm educated. Why can't I fill that role? And that would take a lot of humility to lay down my intellectual or oratory gifts and maybe not have the opportunity to use them as I feel fit. The only thing that helps me out in that is I too am the bride of Christ. And I understand collectively as a church, but I also think of myself individually that Jesus is my spouse. Jesus is the head of my household. And I am so happy to yield to his will and leadership and authority. And I don't feel disabused. I don't feel less than. I don't feel like I'm not valued and esteemed. I find my worth in Christ. And I'm not saying you should find your worth in your husband or things like that, but all of us should find that worth and value in Christ. And remember, in the Christian economy, God turns the value system on its head. It's not those that are in top and power that are most noble and esteemed, but it is the low and the meek, the servant of all is the one in God's eyes is above all. And so think about that. And that helps me on a personal level. I don't know if that would help me if I was a woman, but I think that's interesting. Okay, I'm running out of time. I think I have time to show my two videos. So I'm gonna stop this one. And um, the next chapter I want you to read is the one on um, social inequality, social and wealth inequality. In my book, it's chapter 11. All right.